Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, before we do get started, I want to let you know today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thanks so much for your support. You can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Now it is time uh, for me to go ahead and let you know what we have up as a uh, re- review over at uh, greatdetectives.net. Uh, this uh, weekend, uh, I've gone ahead and I've posted my review of Too Many Clients by Rex Stout. All right, well, uh, we'll take a listen to the lineup. This week's episode of the lineup has a sponsor. So here now is the Modern Sounds case. The lineup. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. Tomorrow at your Plymouth dealers, a new kind of low-priced car. Yes, announcing the completely new Plymouth for 1953. More luxurious, more powerful, more comfortable with new glamorous lines. A great advance in car value at no advance in price. That's the stunning new 53 Plymouth, result of a whole new concept of car design, True Balance. True Balance brings new sleekness to Plymouth styling. Down-sweeping hood that lets you see closer up front. Curved one-piece windshield, bigger windows, handsome rear deck. True Balance brings new beauty to Plymouth interiors. Rich fabrics in harmonizing colors. Stylish instrument panel with glove compartment centered. And there's greater roominess front and rear. Best of all, Plymouth's True Balance gives the smoothest ride ever. All this plus an engine stepped up to 100 horsepower. Higher compression ratio. Truly a great advance in car value. Yet there's no advance in Plymouth price. In fact, four new models are actually priced lower than last year. You'll want to meet the new Plymouth. Be sure you do it tomorrow. This weekend only, Plymouth offers six new 53 Plymouth free. In a big contest, you won't want to miss. So stand by for details later in the show. I've never been anywhere near criminals before, Lieutenant. Well, there's nothing to be nervous about, Mrs. Tyson. Well, I hope not. Yeah, yeah sit right here. Oh, I, I can't help thinking about that poor girl. What happened to her? Now, don't worry, Mrs. Tyson. They can't see you. I hope not. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name, and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. At the end of each line, when I ask for questions or identifications, call out the number. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice, so do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. All right, bring on the line. I, I thought Even you said moment, they could be the seen. Well, they can that's right. Well, they right can't see the through end. that screen. I'll turn all of you and face the screen. When you answer my question, sing out. The people on the other side of the screen want to hear you. All right, number one, David Shatlock, Grand Theft Auto. Step right up there, Dave. That's it. Where do you live, Dave? He's got in town. Where do you come from, Dave? Detroit. 
Look at the screen, not the floor. What were you doing at the filling station? What filling station? The arresting officers picked you up at a filling station at 9th and Central. Is that where it was? Where'd you get the car, Dave? What car? The car you were driving when the officers arrested you. I wasn't driving no car. How'd you get here from Detroit? I drove. The car had California plates. It did? Where'd you get it, Dave? I don't know no car. Recognize him, Mr. All right. No. Slide right down, Dave. No, that isn't him. Number that two, is. Charles Whiteside, aggravated assault. Step right up, Charlie. That's it. Where do you live? Kenton Street. Sing out, Charlie. Kenton Street. What number? Uh, 2300 and something. I don't know. How long you lived there? Two days. Where'd you live before that? I was on the road. Anybody arrested with you? Yeah. Who? Oh. Dutch. What's his full name? I, I don't know. I do. Francis Dutch Kramer. He'll be number eight in the next line. Anybody else? Yeah. A couple of guys. Stu and Fink. Stu Humboldt, Fink Halverson. They'll be in the next line, too. You know why you're here, Charlie? Yeah. Why? Cops said we slugged the guy. Did you? I guess. Why, Charlie? He tried to roll us. One guy tried to roll the four of you? So he ain't bright. All right, number three. Thomas Kruitzer, open charge. Step right up and face front, Tom. That's right. Where do you live, Tom? Uh, 6231 uh, Grove Court, Sergeant. What do you do for a living? Uh, building superintendent. A janitor? Uh, yes. Know why you're arrested, Tom? Oh, I imagine it's about that girl who was found murdered, isn't it? That uh, Jean Bellamy. What do you know about it, Tom? Well, I read about it in the papers. It was a brutal thing, beating to death like that. That's all you know? Yeah. Brutal thing, though. What were you doing at the Brent Freeway underpass, Tom? When you mean, Sergeant? When the officers picked you up. Oh, I was walking home from work. At two in the morning? Well, I often work late at night. That's what I was doing last night. I was working late. That girl was found dead in the underpass, Tom. Yeah, I know that, sir. How do you know? Well, I read about it in the papers. Any questions or identifications from the audience? Just a minute, Sergeant. <coughs> what do you think, Mrs. Tassin? I, I don't know, Lieutenant. I, it could have been him, the man I saw. And then he couldn't. I, I don't know, Lieutenant. Better hold number three, Sergeant. Oh, where's number three, Ben? Tom Crutcher. Uh, Quine's bringing him up. Oh. Your witness identify him? Uh, she saw someone running away from the underpass about the time Jean Bellamy was killed, but she wasn't too sure it was him. It's like everything else about this killing. Nobody's sure of anything. Except that Gene Bellamy was murdered. How much you got on it, Ben? Yeah, there it is. Uh, age 23, Caucasian, single, lived at 421 Hampton Court. Mm -hmm. What's the landlady say? Had an apartment there alone, quiet, respectable. Went out a lot, but no parties in the apartment. Worked as a car hop at Rutgers Drive-In. There six months. One of the top girls. Friendly with everyone. Left work alone at 8 o'clock the night she was killed. It looks like that's all, huh? That's it. Can't find anybody who saw her from the time she left work until the squad car found her in the underpass at 1.17 the next morning. It makes it tough. A deal like this, no suspects, no motives, no witnesses. Uh, maybe a crystal will clean it up for us. Pretty optimistic. I said maybe. Yeah, here, Tom. Uh, sure, sir. You let Sergeant Carter in the line, Tom? This is Lieutenant Guthrie. Glad to know you, Lieutenant. Sit down, Tom. Thank you. Know why you're here, Tom? Well, no, not exactly. No. Somebody out there identifying me for something? Should they have? Well, I don't know. After all, this big important murder and everything, they really made a big splash in the papers, didn't they? Murders usually do. Yeah, lots of publicity, all right. You said you read about the murder in the papers. Uh, that's right. I could hardly miss it, all the headlines and everything. That all you know about it? Well, why should I know anything else? Well, we're asking you. Yeah, coffee smells good. You yeah, want some? No, no, thank you. It keeps me awake. What do you know about the murder, Tom? Well, where do you want me to start, Lieutenant? You killed Jean Bellamy? Oh, yeah, of course I could. Why, Tom? Oh, I guess I love Jean too much, Lieutenant. I guess that's why I killed her. Tell us about it, Tom. Oh, it's really pretty simple. It's like I said. Uh... See, you know, Lieutenant, I think I changed my mind. 
What? About that coffee. Could I have a cup of that, please? No, I'll get it. You said it was pretty simple, Tom. Oh, yeah, like I said. You see, I love Jean, only she didn't love me. There was a story like that once in a magazine I read. They called it Unrequited Romance. That yeah, sounds pretty, doesn't it? Is that coffee ready, Sergeant? Yeah, here it is, Tom. Cream? Sugar? No, oh, black, please. Yeah? Where'd you kill her? Well, it was in the Brent Freeway underpass. It was two nights ago. You see, she'd finally agreed to go for a walk with me after she got through work. She never had before, so she said she would that night. I guess she was just sorry for me. I didn't ask her to be sorry for me. That's not what I wanted from her, but I, I guess she was in here. So we went for a walk. To the Brent Freeway underpass? Yeah, that's right. What happened then, Tom? <clears throat> hmm? And what happened in the underpass? Well, I killed her. What'd you use? Say, that coffee's good. Probably keep me awake. Man. What did you use, Tom? What weapon, you mean? Yeah. Oh. Well, it was an old piece of pipe I found in the underpass. You know, it's funny. I was going to kill her all the time, but I hadn't figured out how yet. Then I saw that old piece of pipe there. I guess I was lucky. What'd you do with it afterwards, Tom? The pipe, you mean? Yeah. Well, there's uh, that lagoon near the underpass. The water's pretty deep there, I understand. I threw it in there. That made it a pretty perfect crime, I thought. Mm-hmm. Say, so, you know, Lieutenant, I... I'm sorry. What about? Well, because I threw that pipe away, that, that would have made things easier for you, the fingerprints and everything. Hey, yeah, I guess that was a mistake. It wasn't your biggest one. What do you think, Ben? Well, Kutz's story checks out. Only you don't believe him. Everything he told us he could have read in the papers. All we've got is his confession. No corroborating evidence. Yeah. That'll make it tough on us if he's a confessing Sam. Oh, Doc Gorson will know. Is he finished with it? Then let's find out. That's fine. Ah, Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Carter. What kind of troubles bring you here, gentlemen? Mental, physical, or romantic? Now, just tell us how romantic Kreutzer's confession was, Doc. Oh, yeah. Thomas Alva Kreutzer. An interesting character, Thomas. Freud would have had a field day with him. He's a confessing Sam. Well, there's a day and a half shot. What makes a guy do a thing like that, Doc? Confess to a crime he didn't commit. Yeah, it's a curious phenomenon. If you have a couple of hours to spare, I'd be happy uh, to... We'll see you around, Doc. No intellectual curiosity. All right, chalk it up to an irresistible psychological need for attention. Uh, why not boil it down that way in your report? Taxpayers have fired me for not giving you the money to enforce Because he's right here, Captain. For you, Guthrie. Huh. Thanks. Nice. Guthrie. Waldo, Ben. Got something for you on that Bellamy girl. Be right there. Ah, come in, Ben. The coaches are confessing Sam. Huh? Ah, yeah, looks like it, Bill. Well, here's something else for you to work on. Mm -hmm. Black address book. Gene Bellamy's? That's right. Well, it did turn up. Came to the mail this morning. Anything with it? Note, letter? No, just that. Plain envelope addressed with letters cut from newspaper headlines. Dropped at 5th and Central around 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Any prints? Letter carriers, sorters, Gene Bellamy's. Some partials from another woman's left hand. What did latent prints say? No record. They're forwarding to the FBI. Mm -hmm. Hey, plenty of names in this book. All men. Must be 50, 60 of them. 77, Ben. Now find out which one killed her. Third precinct, Fogarty. Hey, Sarge Dowdy, have you heard? There's going to be a body found tomorrow and $25,000. What? Well, one thing at a time, boy. A body where? In Whitley Showroom, the Plymouth Theater on High Street. You better be there. First chance to see the Rip Snort new 53 Plymouth. But and what about the body? Terrific. Completely new this year. That 53 Plymouth looks like no other car you've ever seen. It's smart, sleek. Enough of your shenanigans. All this talk about a body. This is just a car, buddy. Just a car, Sergeant. What you said. This isn't just a car. It's a Plymouth. The new Plymouth. They're saying it's a milestone in automotive history. First car in the low-priced field with true balance. 
And you call it just a car. Sarge, listen, this Plymouth is completely new from the wheels up. 100 horsepower, new body, new chassis, new design, new ride. All right, all right, all right. Now, what were you saying about $25,000? Prizes in a Meet the New Plymouth contest. You get empty blanks from any Plymouth dealer starting tomorrow. But the contest closes next Monday midnight. All right, boy, all right. I'll be there tomorrow. I'll enter the contest. Now, for the love of Mike, will you get back to your beat? Okay. But, Sarge, my feet hurt. What this police force needs is a new Plymouth. Can we talk about this in the hall, Lieutenant? My boss finds out the cops are talking to no, me. That's okay. Thank you. Look, uh, Lieutenant, about this Jean Bellamy, I, I, I don't know nothing about it. Well, you knew her, didn't you? Oh, sure, sure, I knew her. Well, that is, uh, I took her out twice, and, and that's all, Lieutenant, honest. Now, when's the last time you saw her? Oh, maybe a year ago, a year and a half. She phoned me a couple of times afterwards, asked for money, but uh, I didn't see her again, you see. I, I don't know nothing about this, Lieutenant, honest. Yes, that's right, Lieutenant. Jean and I were quite friendly for a while. Uh, how long ago, Mr. Havercamp? Well, we stopped seeing each other about six months ago. And why was that? I came to my senses, I guess. I'm a married man, two children in high school, an elder of my church. I'm quite ashamed of myself now, but a beautiful girl like Jean can have an awful hold on a middle-aged man, Lieutenant. <laughs> Sure, Gene went for me in a big way, Sergeant. We hit the hot spots together for a while. I haven't seen her for maybe two, three months now. You know how it is, Sergeant. Well, what hot spots did you hit, Richie? Well, there was always one joint she wanted to go to. Over across an avenue, the Blue Parrot. Always the same joint. But what's to do in a nightclub? I got tired. You know how it is. like a dump. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not too busy. Well, it's early, yeah. Probably be jammed another hour or two. Yeah. Come on in, boys. Got a good table for you right over here. Are uh, the manager in? Oh, that lazy creep don't get here this early. Tell your troubles to Alma. Uh, we want information, Alma. Cops? That's right. Uh, let's see. Sure. Uh-huh. Let's talk over here. Sit down. Have something on the house. No, no, thanks. Sure? No, thanks. Hey, give me a bourbon on the rocks, Joe. Okay, Alma. Well, what's on your mind, boys? Jean Bellamy. That figured. You knew her? Sure, a real tough break for that kid. Now, what can you tell us about her? Oh, swell kid, always laughing like a good time. Nuts for the kind of music they play here. She hung around here a lot? Yeah, almost every night. Why? She wasn't out on the town, if that's what you mean. She knew lots of men. She wasn't out on the town. Just didn't want to be a car hop all her life, so she was looking for the right guy. She ever find him? Yeah, she said she did. When? The night she was killed. She was in here then? That's right. Anybody with her? Yeah, Alma. Thanks, Joe. Who was with Jean that night? Nobody. You sure? I said nobody. What about this guy she said she'd found? She just said she found him. Give his name? Anything else about him? Nothing. What time did she leave here? Oh, 11, 11.30. 11 Alone? She met somebody outside. Man? Yeah. Ever seen him before? Yeah, he used to come here with Gene pretty often. I haven't seen him for six or eight months, though. Know his name? No. Well, what's he look like? Oh, he's maybe 45, 50, medium height. Has a little scar in the corner of his mouth. Horn rim glasses. Nice looking guy. They live in a car? Yeah. What kind? I don't know. It was a nice looking car, pretty new. I don't know what kind, though. Well, what color was it? Blue, I think. Some kind of light blue. Did you happen to notice the license number? Hey, did you ever play license plate poker? Trying to make the best poker hand out of the numbers you see in license plate? Yeah, I play it all the time. Make mind bets with myself. Sounds crazy, but I like it. What about it? Well, when I come in here that night, the best hand I'd seen was two pairs. Nines over deuces. The guy who drove Gene away that night beat me. You remember what he beat you with? A low straight. Four, five, six, seven, eight. You sure about that? Yeah. Sure looked like a good bet for a winning hand. Not for Gene Bellamy, it wasn't. Now, how'd 
How'd you do, Pete? You're right about our man, Ben. Get the report from motor vehicle? Yeah. License number 10X45678. Issued to John W. Havoc Camp, 611 Nestor Drive. Yeah, from Alma's description, it had to be him. He was driving a coupe the day we questioned him. Well, that was his wife's car. Neighbors say he hasn't been driving his sedan since the day after Gene Bellamy was killed. Anybody checking for it? Klein's been out all day. I gotta get some cigarettes. Oh, here, have one of mine. Oh, it makes me cough. That's not what the ads say. They still make me cough. Can we pin it on Havoc Camp? I don't know. Good defense lawyer could blow Alma's testimony sky high. She got a record? Yeah, two counts. Drunk driving, disturbing the peace. The prints don't match with those on Gene Bellamy's address book, though. You need any cigarettes? Uh-oh. Have a camp. Alibi's phony. Claimed to be at a movie at the Great Western Theater. It was closed that night. It was decorating. Oh, that'll help. Well, maybe. Any motive? He told us he stopped seeing Gene Bellamy six months ago. For his family's sake, came to his senses. Only his wife filed a divorce action on November 10th. Mental cruelty. Well, just a week ago. Yeah. A couple of days after Gene Bellamy died. Want to talk to the wife? Yeah, just as soon as... Guthrie. Quiet, Ben. I found the Havoc Amsterdam. Where is it? The Lester upholstery shop, 11th Central, having new seat covers put in. Blood stains on the upholstery? Yeah. Havoc Camp told him he had a bad nosebleed. We'll give him a chance to prove it. <laughs> the back? No, no. Somebody's coming. What is it, please? Is Mr. Havercamp at home? What did you want to see him about? We're police officers. Police? That's right. Is he in? No. No, he's not home. Are you Mrs. Havercamp? Yes. When do you expect your husband, Mrs. Havercamp? I don't know. Will he be home later this evening? I don't know. Where is he now? I don't know. Could we talk to you for a few minutes, Mrs. Havercamp? I don't know anything about my husband's affairs. It'll only take a few minutes. All right. Thank you. Now, what is it, please? Mrs. Havercamp, does the name Jean Bellamy mean anything to you? Yes. Could you tell us what you know about her? I know she was murdered about ten days ago. Is that all you know? Yes. You sure, Mrs. Havercamp? You said you wanted to talk to my husband. Why are you asking me all these questions? Did you know your husband and Jean Bellamy were friends? Yes. You knew he'd been seeing a lot of her the past year? Yes. What did you think about that? I didn't mind. Did you do anything about it? No. You sure? You've got no right to ask me questions a like A girl's that. been murdered, Mrs. Havercamp. I had nothing to do with it. Did your husband... Mrs. Havercamp. <laughs> he killed her, didn't he? Yes. Did he tell you? Not at first. How'd you find out? Jean Bellamy's address book? Yes. It was on the garage floor the next morning. Must have fallen out of the car without him knowing. You mailed it into us? She'd been killed. Somebody was guilty. Somebody had to pay. Why did he kill her, Mrs. Havercamp? She deserved to die. She had no right to do to him what she did. She had... Your husband? No, that must be my daughter. She's at a party tonight. She said she'd call. May I? Oh, sure. Hello? Yes, Beth, dear. Are you having a good time? Oh, that's wonderful, dear. You go ahead and enjoy yourself. Just try not to get back too late. Oh, yes, dear. We're all right. Just sitting around reading. Of course. Of course I'll give Daddy a big kiss for you. Goodbye, Beth. That's one of the reasons Jean Bellamy deserved to die. Our children. 
wrecking up my husband's life and mine and our children. He was a wonderful man. A wonderful husband and father. Before he met her. Why'd he kill her? He'd given her up once. I thought he was all over it. Then, a week before it happened, he told me he couldn't fight it any longer. She was driving him out of his mind. He was going back to her. And what happened then? He told me about it this afternoon. How he'd met her that night. Then she told him it was all off. She was going to marry somebody else. She laughed at him. I'll never forget his face as he told me about her laughing at him. I guess he went a little crazy after that. Where's your husband now? Out back, in the garage. What's he doing there? We decided that would be best for the children. Looked like an accident. He's been there almost 15 minutes. Come on, Pete. Must be a back door in the kitchen. Yeah, there it is. Hit that side door. There he is. Here. Let's get him. Okay. Put him down. How's he look, Ben? Not too bad. Better call in. Yes, sure. He looks so quiet and peaceful. He hasn't looked that well since before he met her. Is he dead? No. He's going to live. Oh, that's too bad. It's so quiet and peaceful now. And then, when he wakes up again, that's too bad. to win a sleek 53 Plymouth convertible? That's just one of hundreds of prizes offered in a big Meet the New Plymouth contest. Easy to enter. In 50 words or less, tell on an official entry blank what you like most about the New Plymouth. With 75 New Plymouth features, you'll find plenty to rave about. So visit your Plymouth dealers tomorrow. Meet the New 53 Plymouth and get your entry blank for the big $25,000 contest. But don't put it off. Contest closes next Monday. The lineup for before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you the lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Cogger, Sergeant Pete Cogger. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number the name of the The lineup starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie with Jack Moyles as Sergeant Pete Cogger was written by Sidney Marshall with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, James McCallion, John McIntyre, Howard McNear, High Everback, Sidney Miller, and Virginia Gregg. The lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The lineup was presented tonight by Plymouth. Remember, tomorrow, visit your nearby Plymouth showroom to meet the new 53 Plymouth. A great advance in car value at no advance in price. Dan Coverly speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. Whoa.
welcome back. Uh, there are a couple things that stand out to me about this episode. First, I think versus modern stories is the um, idea of uh, telling a story like this, but without any sort of um, uh, exploitative uh, ness or uh, and it's definitely a contrast between today's um, uh, crime dramas, which often can almost seem to revel in this sort of thing. Uh, I think that both the murderer and his wife were in quite a state, based on what we heard in this episode, where they really weren't thinking rationally. Either that or the writers made a mistake, but I'd like to think they're just showing the state of emotional distress they're in. Uh, particularly with the suicide towards the end, or suicide attempt, uh, hoping that would remain uh, considered an accident. That was a bit, a uh, bit much to hope, given that uh, the police suspected him of murder and his wife had just filed for divorce. Yeah, they're not going to think accident in that case, and I think uh, particularly the time of day they portrayed. But I think it's somewhat understandable just because of the duress that they were uh, under and, and what this meant. And really, just a lot of conflicting actions here. Uh, the sponsorship was interesting in that radio had reached the point in 1952 uh, when uh, companies could really buy um, a single uh, a single episode just to promote that and then uh the, the series would go back to sustain uh, and the the little skit for plymouth in the middle i think was kind of cute all right well that will do it for today we'll be back on monday with another johnny dollar serial and then join us back here on uh saturday for another episode of the lineup in the meantime send your comments to box 13 at greatdetectives.net and uh, follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.